Okay, hello. This in this video we're going to cover 13.5. And if you notice, I did previously work on this problem um, and I was recording, but I just felt like <laughs> the video was not the best. I think I made a mistake on every single problem. So don't be intimidated with all these checks thinking that everything was perfect the first go round. <laughs> This is evidence, you know, we are human, right? Um, and so I just, the video dragged on forever. And um, it was like an hour and a half. And I, just looking back at it, I was like, there's no reason why this video should be that long. Um, and it was truly just because I kept making a mistake and then needing to take time to find that error. And it always turned out to be something simple, like I forgot to bring down a variable or... Um, I made an error in a computation, trying to do too much in my head. Um, so I just wanted to start all over and do the problems again. Um, of course, we already kind of know what the answer should be, but I still want to share how we get to those answers, okay? Um, and then I never did get to number eight because I just felt like the video was already too long and I just stopped it and just decided to re-record it, okay? So here I am, another day. Um, and we're gonna go with number one. So in number one, it says us uh, of the whole sections about the chain rule. So make sure that you read the information in the slides about the chain rule. And for us, if they want us to find DW, DT, we're gonna apply that chain rule that it's basically like the differentials, but because we're integrating with respect to a variable that's not in W, we have to apply that um, chain rule. So we have to do this one for the derivative with respect to x, and then we have to do another set for the derivative with respect to y. Okay, um, and let me fix my focus here because if I don't, it just keeps adjusting every time I move my hand in and out of the camera. Okay, see now it doesn't do that. So um for this particular problem i'm going to do the derivative with respect to x so if i look at w and i take this derivative with respect to x i will get 2x plus zero since there's no x's in this second term that will act like a constant and so the derivative of a constant with respect to x is just zero then i'm going to multiply by the derivative of x with respect to t so here's the function for x, and the derivative of this with respect to t is just 4. Plus, now we're going to take the derivative of w, but with respect to y. So x squared is like a constant because there are no y's in it. And so the derivative of that constant will be 0. And then the derivative of y squared with respect to y is 2y. And then now for the derivative of y with respect to t, we're taking the derivative of 3t which is just t, I mean, sorry, which is just three with respect to t. And so if I clean this up, this becomes eight x and this becomes six y. Um, and so I could have typed that in for dw dt, but since they were asking me for the derivative with respect to t, it's very important that our expression is in the correct uh, variable. So all I did from here, was plug in the representation for x in terms of t, and then the representation of y in terms of t. And so what that does is that gives me um, 32t plus 18t, and this is how we obtained the 50t, the response that's inside that box. What in the world was that noise? It, my desk made this really weird noise. Um, I know I have the noise canceling um, activated on my video because I'm in my office um, and the walls are thin. <laughs> so sometimes you can hear the conversations and the other people around the offices. And so I always have the noise canceling um, activated, but I swear to you, my desk just made this really, it almost sounded like a growl, it was so weird. Anyway, <laughs> let's keep going. So now it says to evaluate dw dt at a given t value, and they did give me a t value. So if I do dw dt at this certain point, um, the certain t value point, I don't really write it like that. I write it like this, 
I'm just going to be honest with you. I always write it at t equals two. And I get sometimes people will use the notation of dw dt and they'll put a bar in t equals two. It's all the same thing. It just means we're about to evaluate um, this expression. And so you just plug in um, two into this figure or this expression and you get that 100 that you see there in the box, okay? So number two, moving on. Now I didn't make any mistakes here just yet in my first video. It wasn't until I got to about number three that I was, I don't know what was going on, but let's see what we get. And we have y equal to e to the negative five t and no t value, okay. So this one asked me to find dw dt by using the chain rule. So I'm going to literally repeat the same process that we did in number one. So we have dw dx times dx dt plus dw dy times dy dt. And so the derivative of W with respect to X would just be the constant multiplier Y times one. Then the derivative of X with respect to T is gonna be E to the three T times the derivative of this, which is old school chain rule, um, we get three. Now I'm gonna move on and the derivative of W with respect to Y is going to be the X constant multiplier times one. And then the derivative of y with respect to t is going to be e to the negative 5t, again, regular chain rule, times negative 5. I'm just going to put it in parentheses. So it doesn't look like minus, right? And so then here we have 3y e to the 3t. Here we have negative 5x e to the negative 5t. And again, it's asking us for dw dt, so we do want to have everything in terms of um, t. So I'm going to plug in the expression for y and the expression for x. Oops. Wrong variable. And then I'm going to apply my um, exponent rules, OK? So when you have um, an exponent with this or uh, an expression with the same base, you're going to add those exponents when they're multiplied to one another. So my first term will stay three. Um, oh, I missed a term. This became y, but then I still should have had an e to the three t next to it. So three, this in parentheses becomes my y, and then I should still have the three e to the or the e to the three t. Then here, five, the x becomes e to the three t, and I still have the e to the negative five t. So I'm gonna add these exponents, giving me negative two. And then I'm also gonna add these exponents, giving me another negative two. And so both of these are, are like terms, which means I can combine them and I get negative two e to the negative two t. And this is the response you see in that first box, okay? The box up here. Now for the bottom part, this is for part B. So in part A, I use the chain rule just like I did in part one. But in part B, it's saying find dw dt by converting w into a function of t before differentiating. So here we converted it into a function with t after differentiating, okay? Now we're gonna do it before and see if it's the same or if it's different, okay? So we have w, and instead of writing x, y, I'm going to write in the expression for x and the expression for y. And again, when we multiply two, two expressions with the same base, we can add their exponents, giving me a negative 2t exponent. Then if I want to take dw dt, I'm going to take the derivative of this with respect to t. It's e to the negative 2t, regular chain rule, times the negative 2. So it's negative two e to the negative two t, which happens to be the same thing as what we got before. So it really doesn't make a difference. However, the more complicated the w is and the more complicated it is to take that derivative, um, it may be easier or more complicated to use one version versus another, 
Okay, and so sometimes we may want to do chain rule and sometimes we may just want to revert back to the, the same variable and then um, take the derivative after that. Okay, now number three. So let's get on to number three. And number three was one of the ones that I, will, I wasted the most time on the first time I did this video because I don't know why, but my brain wanted to optimize and that's not what the problem was asking me to do. And so I was optimizing what I thought was clever to optimize, but then it turned out that that's not what I was supposed to be doing. So it all went for nothing. So I'm gonna do it this time and hopefully not waste a, a lot of time on this, okay? So it says the parametric equations for the pass of two projectiles are given, okay? Um, at what rate did the distance between the two objects, or at what rate is the distance between the two objects changing at the given value of t, okay? And it does say t is equal to pi over two, okay? So in this particular problem, um, we're going to be trying to take the rate of the distance, which means that my function um, f of, I guess, x1, y1 or just f of x, not necessarily, OK? And it actually will not be. I'm trying, I'm struggling with the labels because the variables are going to change. So I'm just going to say distance is this formula x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. We remember that from um, algebra, okay? And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug all of the expressions for x1, x2, y1, y2. And what will be left is a function in terms of t, okay? So we'll be left with a function in terms of t. And that function will be, and instead of using a house, I'm just going to use a giant bracket with a one-half exponent. So let's go ahead and plug in. We're going to get 5 cosine of t minus 10 cosine of 2t. And then squared plus y2 minus y1. And then the whole thing is gonna be to the power of one half, okay? Now, if I wanna find the rate at which this is um, changing, what we're gonna have to do is find f prime, okay? So we have to take the derivative of all of this. So I'm going to be probably applying chain rule quite a bit here, but we are going to start working on F prime, okay? And the first thing is, is no matter what the base is, you're going to bring the power down and repeat that base. So bear with me while I repeat my base, and then you can decrease your exponent by one. This is just applying the power rule. So when I decrease this power by one, I get negative one half. But chain rule says that as if my base is not just t or not just the variable that I'm integrating with respect to, if it's anything other than just that variable, then I do have to go ahead and apply the chain rule. So now I need to take the derivative of everything that's inside. Now, luckily there are two terms inside so I'm going to put a big bracket. I'm not going to be able to squeeze anything in there. So I'm going to start down here. But I'm going to have two terms, and then I can close my bracket, OK? So in this bracket, I'm going to have bring down my power, keep the base the same, decrease the power by 1, and then multiply by the derivative inside the base, OK? So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this becomes five sine of t. 
And then the derivative of cosine is also negative sine. So this will become positive 10 cosine of 2t. But since my angle is not just t like this one, I do have to apply the chain rule. So when I multiply by 2, I'm just going to go ahead and do it now and change this 10 to a 20. Again, it has to do with that chain rule of the trig function. And so now I have officially taken the derivative of the first term inside these brackets. See, there my, my desk made that noise again. Um, now I'm going to put a plus sign, and I'm going to take the derivative of the second term. So the second term is going to be, again, power comes down. You keep the base the same. Decrease the power by 1, and then you multiply by the derivative of the base. So the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of sine is, again, cosine. But then I would have to apply the chain rule, which would give me a 2, but I'm going to go ahead and multiply by that 2 right now and be done with it. And so this is the end of my derivative of this giant um, base. So let's recover that. We brought the power down. We rewrote the base, decreased the power by one. And then inside these braces, we took the derivative of both of the terms of the base. OK? So now we need to simplify this. Actually, I wouldn't even bother. OK? I think I mentioned that in the hints at the top, um, just because it's a lot going on there. It says for number three, do not simplify the derivative before evaluating it. Just differentiate and then evaluate, OK? So I am going to do just that. Um, but I am going to take a little note real quick before I do this. I want you to notice that when I plug in pi over 2, OK, this will become cosine of pi over 2, right? Here. The, co the two and this two will cancel. So I'll literally just be left with the cosine of pi. Similarly, the same thing's gonna happen for the sine. I'm gonna have the sine of um, pi over two. And then I'm gonna have the sine of, in this case, just pi, okay? And so I can figure out what those values are. Cosine of pi over two is zero. Cosine of pi is negative one. Sine of pi over two is zero. No, it's not zero, it's one. Sorry. And then sine of pi is zero. So remember, this is for cosine of t. This is for cosine of 2t, OK? This one's for sine of t. And this one is for sine of 2t. Again, of course, all at the t value of pi over two. So as I plug in my numbers, I'm not going to plug in pi over 2 and pi. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace cosines of t's with zeros, sine of 2 t's with negative 1, so on and so forth, OK? Just to cut down on all of the writing, because this is four, three lines just for one computation, right? So I want to cut down on having to rewrite three lines and then three lines again, OK? So what do we get at f prime of pi over 2? we get one half bracket and then five times zero minus 10 times cosine of 2t is negative one. Um, and this whole thing is squared plus four times sine of t is going to be replaced with one and then sine of 2t is going to get replaced with 0 squared raised to the negative 1 half. And then um, I could probably fit a little bit of this in here. So 2 times 5 times cosine of t, which is 0, minus 10 times sine of cosine of 2t, which is negative 1. And that's raised to the first power. And then negative 5 times sine t which is one plus 20 times cosine, or yeah. Something happened here. This is not right. 
I brought my power down, wrote down the base, and then I took the derivative of the um, base. Now this derivative is correct, but, and I know I verbally said the derivative of cosine was negative sine, which is why this turned to positive, but I didn't write down sine. That's not good. It needed to be sine. So sine of 2t is actually the value zero. Then I'm gonna put my plus sign, open this parentheses. Oh, and I forgot my two, didn't I? No, I didn't, it's right there. Two, all of this evaluated, all of that evaluated. Now we're doing plus two, four times sine of t, which is one, minus six times sine of two t, which is zero to the one power then four times cosine of t, which is zero, minus 12 times cosine of two t, which is negative one. And that closes out that bracket. And so let's simplify this a little bit more. Um, this is zero, so we just get positive 10 squared, plus this is zero, so we get positive four squared, raised to the negative one half. Inside the brace, we get two times positive 10 times, that's zero, negative five, plus two times, this is zero, so four, times, this is zero, so 12. So we get one half, 100 plus 16. And over here, let's see, that is gonna be, I think, negative 100. And this is going to be eight times 12, I think is 96. Yes, 96. So then we get one half of 116 to the negative one half. And then in here, we just get a multiplier of negative four. Those actually reduce. So I get negative two times 116 to the negative one half. What in the world is that? Negative two, parentheses, one, one, six, raised to the negative one half. And I do, this does round to two decimal places. That five will affect that. So it'll be negative 0 0.19. Oh, you couldn't see. So one half, 100 plus 16. This gave me negative 100, this gave me 96. I computed inside these braces and I got negative four. <coughs> Excuse me, now remember, this is a factor multiplied by all of that. So then the negative four and the half reduced to two and I typed this in the calculator. And that's what it gave me as my answer. And it does match what I have in that box over there. So we're good in that, in that regard. Now let's go ahead and see what we have for number four. I don't think I'll be able to fit that in there. So I'm gonna go to another page. So for number four, here we have W equals Y cubed minus six X squared Y. Um, X equals E to the S, Y equals E to the T. And then we have S equals negative one and T equals two, okay? Um, and so then W is actually, since it's got Y's and X's, it has S's and T's. So when we're talking about that, we can put at the, the point one, two, where this is S and this is T. I'm only mentioning that now because I will use this notation later. What is the goal? It's asking us to find dw, ds, and then dw, dt, okay? Now remember, in order for us to do that, we have to find those chain rules, okay? So dw, ds is going to be dw, dx, dx, ds, plus dw, dy, and then dy, ds. Okay, so... Let's see what we get here. For dw dx, the, this does not have any x's in it. So the derivative of it with respect to x would be zero. For um, this term, negative six y is like the constant multiplier. And then the derivative of x squared is two x. 
Then for dx, d, I'm sorry, yeah, dx, ds, um, we're going to take the derivative of this, which is just e to the s. The derivative of s is just one, so I didn't really apply that chain rule there. Or I did, but didn't write it, right? Because it won't change anything. Now dw, dy is taking the derivative of both terms, so this becomes 3y squared. My constant multiplier here is 6x squared, but the derivative of y is 1. And then dy ds is, there's no s's in this expression. So this is like a constant with respect to s. So the derivative with respect to s would just be 0, which basically cancels out that whole um, second term. And so what do we get for this guy? We get negative um, 12xy e to the s. Now that is not in terms of um, s or t, okay? And w should be in terms of s and t, okay? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in the expressions for x and the expression for y. And we already know that if we're multiplying stuff with the same base, we're just adding the exponents. So we get 2s plus t as our exponent of our exponential. And so if you notice in this first box, that's exactly what I have typed in there, what we just now um, obtained, okay? So now we're gonna do the same similar thing for dw dt. We're gonna do dx, or I'm sorry, dw dx, dx dt now, dw dy, and then dy dt. So the derivative, the derivative with respect to x and the derivative of w with respect to y are not going to change. Those are the same thing. So I'm just going to use the same derivative that I already took. I'm going to clean it up a little bit actually. And then plus and the same derivative over here. The only part that's new is that now I'm taking the derivative with res of x and y, but with respect to t. So here, when I take the derivative of x with respect to t, this doesn't have any t's in it. So it's a constant, and the derivative of a constant is just 0. But then to take the derivative of y with respect to t, it does have a t. So the derivative of e to the t is e to the t. Again, if you do the chain rule, it's just times 1, so it doesn't really affect anything. But this zero is gonna make all of that term go away, which means all I end up with is this expression. And I'm actually gonna put the e to the s, e to the t and distribute the e to the t. So then I don't need this parentheses anymore because I already distributed the e to the t. Right, just the right hand distribution. Okay, so now I'm going to plug in the expressions for x and y. So we get three times e to the t squared, e to the t minus six e to the s squared, e to the t. Now remember, when you have an exponent raised to an exponent, okay, um, what do we get? We get, we multiply those exponents. So this becomes. E 3e to the 2t, e to the t. This one becomes 6e to the 2s, and then e to the t. And then like before, when you're multiplying things with the same base, you can add those exponents. So this becomes 3e to the 3t minus 6e to the 2s plus t. Okay. And that's exactly what we have in our box for the second um, response for dw dt. Now, if I want to find dw dt at the point negative one, two, we're just going to take this, or I'm sorry, I need to do ds first, not dt first. We're going to take the expression that we got for dw ds and plug in negative one for s and two for t. So we're going to plug in negative 1 for s and 2 for t. This gives me e to the negative 2 plus 2, which gives me 12e to the 0, which is just negative 12 times 1, 
which is negative 12. Okay, and so you see that that's where that top response comes from. Now dw dt at that same at those same values is going to be this expression. So 3e to the 3 times 2 minus 6e to the 2 times negative 1 plus 2. So we get 3e to the 6 minus 6e to the 0, which is just 3e to the 6 minus 6. And that's the expression that you see there typed in the bottom box. Okay. Now let's go ahead and move on to number five. I do believe I can fit that here. So we have three X squared plus 11 Y squared plus two Z squared equals 49. And they want us to find this, uh, they want us to differentiate implicitly. Okay, so that's the one where we had to like define a capital F function and then take the fx, fy, fz, and then do all the little ratios, okay? So that one's a little bit more um, complicated as far as like what you define your capital F function to be, okay? The easiest way is just to move this over and get it equal to zero, and then let f be that. So in this case, I would say let capital F of, and I have these three variables, x, y, and z be 3x squared, plus 11y squared, oops, plus 2z squared minus 49, okay? And then I'm gonna start finding all of my partial derivatives. So I'm gonna find fx, the derivative of this with respect to x is going to be 6x. This would be zero, zero, and zero. There's no x's in these terms. So they all act like contents, con constants, and then the derivative of those constants is zero. Now we're gonna find fy. This has no y's, the derivative would be zero. And this would be 22y, zero and zero. Now the partial derivative with respect to z, zero, zero, or z minus zero, okay? And then now if I want to find, what do they want? They want d, z, d, x. That means I'm gonna do negative fx over fz. And in this case, that would be negative 6x over 22y, which can reduce to negative 3x over 11y. And if you see there, oh, I wrote the wrong one. I wrote fy, didn't I? I said fz, and then I went and wrote fy. Pay attention, right? This should be 4z. And so then this will reduce, but then it would be 2z. And that is what you should see in the box, yes. And now if they want the other partial derivative, dz dy, that means I'm gonna do negative fy over fz. And fy is 22y, fz is 4z. And if I reduce that, I get a negative 11y over 2z. And so then we get that expression and it matches what's in the other box. Okay, making some headway. Let's get to number six. We're almost done. There's only eight problems in this um, particular section. So we're a little over halfway. Um, we have x squared plus y squared plus c squared minus 3yw plus 2w squared equals 5. So similarly, just like number 5, if I want to define a capital F, I need to minus the 5 over, get it equal to 0, and that will become my capital F function. But this time, I have the variables x, y, z, and w. So x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 3yw minus 2w squared minus 5, okay? And this will be my function. Okay, now let's see. Oh, we need to do our partials. So fx, 
there is only one term with x in it and the derivative of it is 2x. Fy, there are two terms with y in them. The derivative is 2y minus 3w. There is only one term with z, so its derivative is 2z. And then for w, there are two terms with w. So the derivative is negative 3y and negative 4w. Okay, now we're going to find these partial derivatives by using the partial derivatives that we have. So this becomes um, negative fx over fw, which is negative 2x over negative 3y minus 4w. Now you can leave it like that, but we also know that with uh, fractions, it doesn't matter whether the negative is at the top or in the front or at the bottom. These are all equivalent, okay, in sign. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this negative and I'm gonna take it downstairs, okay? When I do that, it's gonna make everything in the denominator change sign. So normally I don't write this step, I just do it. I say, I'm gonna apply that negative downstairs and I just make sure that I apply it to everybody, turning these guys positive. So if you look in the box, notice that it doesn't have the negative two X up top, it has positive, but then it also has positives um, down at the bottom, okay? Um, and there seems to be, oh, because I made an error when I wrote down my function. Notice there was a plus sign here, and when I wrote down my capital F, I changed the sign. So that means that this term should be positive, which means it'll be positive here when I plug it in and here, but then when I change the signs, it should turn to negative. There we go. And now we have it. Now, similarly for d, w, um, d, y, we're gonna do negative f, y over f, w. So f, y is two y minus three w, and there's a negative in the front, over negative three y plus four w. So again, you can take this negative downstairs, but it needs to change both signs. So 2y minus 3w will stay, but the bottom will become 3y minus 4w. And it does match what's in the box. Then similarly for dw dz, we're gonna get negative fz over fw, which is negative 2z over negative 3y plus 4w. Again, take this negative and apply it to the denominator. So you get 2z and then 3y minus 4w, which is exactly what's in this bottom box. Okay, number seven. So this one I did eventually figure out, but we'll talk about that one in a little bit. Now, let's see, I think I can fit, hmm. Can I fit, I think I can fit number seven in here. We'll try. <laughs> if not, we'll go to the next page. So for number seven, it tells us that the radius of a right circular cylinder is increasing at a rate of five inches per minute. So that means that the derivative of the radius with respect to time increasing means a positive five. Now it also says um, the height is decreasing at a rate of three inches per minute. So the rate means the derivative and decreasing means it's negative three inches per minute. And it says, what are the rates of change of the volume and the surface area when the radius is 18 inches and the height I believe is 36. Okay, so we do need to know our, we're talking about a right cylinder, okay? So we're talking about a circle and then there's a right angle that creates the height. And I should probably be the center. Okay, and so you have a cylinder that kind of looks like that. 
I mean, kind of, I'm awful at drawing, you get the idea, but it's a cylinder like this, okay? And then this is your R and that's a radius. It's the same up here, it's still R, okay? So the volume of this kind of thing is going to be the area of the circle, which is pi R squared, but um, you do have a second dimension, another dimension, which is eight, your third dimension, which is H. So we're gonna put the H in there. Um, and then the surface area, I usually use SA, but a lot of times I just use A um, because on a three-dimensional figure, you don't have area. You only have the area of certain faces and then you have surface area, which is like the area of all the faces added up together, okay? So if I talk about these faces, what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have two faces that are circles. And how do you find the area of a circle? It's pi r squared, but because I have one on top and one on bottom, I'm gonna have two pi r squared. But then I also have to add this. Now, if I were to cut this, let's pretend it's something like a, the center cardboard roll of a napkin, right? You have a roll of napkins and you just take out that little center or even a toilet paper roll, right? Take out the little cardboard center. That's a cylinder. I mean, it doesn't have a top and a bottom, but if you were to cut that cylinder and then lay it flat, it's literally a rectangle, okay? So if you were to cut this here and then unroll it, it would literally be like this, okay? Now, H is still this length here, but this width, is actually the circumference of the circle, okay? So if I wanna find the area of this sheet, I need to know the circumference of that circle. And for us, it's two pi r, okay? That's the, the formula for the circumference. So if I wanna find the area of what goes around the cylinder, it's gonna be two pi r h. Okay, now that we have our formulas, we can go figure out dv, dt, and da, dt, okay? Oh, it looks like we use s here. Then we'll use the same letter, okay. And I only know that because I saw s down here at the bottom, okay? So let's do dv, dt. What this means is I'm gonna take the derivative of this with respect to t, okay? Now remember how you take the derivative with respect to t. You have to do dv dr and then dr dt. This is the chain rule. And then dv dh and then dh dt, okay? So let's go ahead and start. So the derivative of v with respect to r, this is gonna act like a constant multiplier. And then the derivative with respect to r is 2r. And we have this dr dt attached. Then here dv dh. So now pi r squared acts like the constant multiplier and the derivative of h with respect to h is one. And then you have this dh dt. Now I was given all of these values. So I was told that h was 36. I was told that R, where's R, was 18. And I was told dr dh was five. Here I have pi, R again is 18 squared times one times dh dt, which is a negative three. So what do we get here? Let's see. Um, 36 times two times 18 times five. I get this number of pi. And here I'm gonna get a negative. So 18 squared times one times three is 972 pi. And if I subtract those, I get 5508 pi. Okay. And so that is how we got that first response that you see up there. Okay, now for the surface area, we're gonna do the same thing, okay? So if I wanna find ds dt, I have to find ds dr times dr dt plus ds dh times dh 
dt. So ds dr, the derivative of this with respect to r, this is my constant multiplier, and the derivative of 2 of r squared is 2r times dr dt. Oh, nope, I have two terms. So I need to scoot this over for a minute, actually. I have two terms, not like this one that only had one term. So the derivative of this term is this, plus the derivative of this term, this acts like our constant multiplier and the derivative of r is one. And then I have the dr dt attached. Plus, okay, now I gotta take ds dh of this, so again, another two terms. There are no h's here, so this acts like a constant. And the derivative of that constant with respect to h is zero. This acts like a constant multiplier. And the derivative of h is one with respect to h. And then we still have that dh dt, OK? So now I'm going to plug in all of the values. Um, I have 2 pi times 2 times r, which is 18 plus 2 pi times h, which is 36 times 1. And then dr dt is actually 5. Plus, then I have really just 2 pi times r, which is 18 times 1. And then dh dt was negative 3. OK, so let me move this up just a little bit so we can finish this computations. So let's figure out this term. 2 times 2 times 18. I get um, 72 pi plus 72 pi times 5 plus um, 2 times 18 is 36 pi times negative 3. So what is that? 144 times 5. This is 720 pi, and this is 36 times 3, 108 pi. And 720 minus 108 is where we get that 612 pi. Okay, and so that is how we obtained those two particular responses. Now, the next one is a little bit more complicated, um, which is why. I was struggling on this one a little bit with being able to write everything out. So I think in order for me to do this problem, I actually wanna turn my paper sideways, okay? And because I already know myself, these lines are really gonna irritate me when I start trying to write this way. Um, so I'm actually just gonna use um, a blank sheet of paper to work this one out, okay? Again, I'm sorry that this problem is the way it is, but it is, okay? And it's not like these things don't actually happen. There are pieces of mechanical equipment that have this shape. Um, so this is a shape that will pop up, unfortunately, um, in real life, right? So we got to get used to it, unfortunately. Um, but I do want to mention something at the very beginning. So I'll do what I did in number seven. First, start by writing in all of our data that's given, OK? So it says the two radii of the frustrum of a right circular cone are increasing at a rate of four meters or four centimeters per minute. So it says both of them, radii, two radii, okay, are increasing at that rate, which means that I'm talking about D capital R DT and D little r DT. And both of them are increasing, so positive, at a rate of four centimeters per minute. It also tells me that the height is increasing at, um, increasing so positive at 21 centimeters per minute. It also tells me to find the rates at which the volume and the surface area are changing when the two radii are 15 and 25 centimeters. Now pay attention to the image because if you notice, little r is a smaller radius than capital R. So when I label them, I'm going to say little r is the smaller radii, and then capital R is going to be that larger value of radii. And then, of course, the height is 10 centimeters. So height is 10 centimeters. Now, at the front, at the very beginning of this 
section, I mentioned to you the formulas. So for the volume, we're going to use pi over three, and then we're gonna have R squared plus R capital R plus capital R squared times H. And for surface area, we're gonna have pi times capital R plus little r times the square root of capital R minus r squared plus h squared, okay? Now for me personally, I am going to rewrite this as um, an exponent because when I have to take the derivative of this later, it does need to be written as an exponent. So become a one half exponent. So I'm gonna slide over real quick so you can see what I wrote, but for the most part, we're not gonna be, um, we're not gonna be working with this just yet, okay? So where are we again? Down there, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the derivative of this. Remember, in order to do dv dt, we have to do dv, oh gosh, this is three variables. So we have to do dv d little r times d little r dt plus dv d capital R times d capital R dt plus um, dv dh times dh dt. So let's see what we get. For the derivative with respect to little r, this and this act like a constant multiplier, okay? Then, I'm gonna use brackets here. Then when I take the derivative of this with respect to little r, this will become two r plus capital R plus zero, because there's no little r's in this term. And I forgot to write the H. I said both of these were going to be like a constant multiplier, right? Okay, so that's dv dr. And then, of course, you have this dr dt tagged along. Now for dv d capital R. So again, these guys are going to act like a constant multiplier. And then the derivative of R squared with respect to capital R is zero. The derivative of this would be little r, and the derivative of this would be two capital R. And then of course you have the d capital R dt attached, plus now I'm gonna do the derivative of uh, v with respect to h. So all of this acts like a constant multiplier because there's no h's in it. And then the derivative of h with respect to h is just one. But of course you have that dh dt attached, okay? Now there's no reason you need to simplify this, just plug in the numbers, okay? So we get pi over three times h, which is 10, times two times r, which is 15, plus capital R, which is 25. And then that gets multiplied by dr dt, which is four. Pi over three times 10, and then little r is 15 plus two times capital R. And then that gets multiplied by capital D capital R DT, which is also a four. So then I get R squared, which is 15 squared plus 15 times 25 plus 25 squared and then times dh dt, which is 21. Okay, oops, you can't see that, but there's my 21. So let's clean this all up. Um, that is 30 plus 25. And so this is 55 times 10. Um, and then times four. So I get two, two, zero, zero pi over three. I don't think I can reduce that by three. Nope, it gives me 0.33333 something. So that's the first term. 
So I don't really need any brackets here. Now I'm going to do plus. Now in here, this is going to be 50 plus 15. 50 plus 15. So this is 65 times 10 and times 4. I get 2600 zero, zero pi over 3. I don't think, nope, that can't give me 0. 0.6 repeating. And then finally, the last term. So let me figure out all of this first. So 15 squared plus 15 times 25 plus 25 squared. So this in here is this number times 21. Gives me this huge number over three with the pi, right? Because that one also had a pi. So let's see, that number plus 2200 zero, zero, plus 2600 zero, zero, gives me 3025. Three. Right, what I'm doing. It's too much to say. <laughs> so I took this number here, right? And then I added the 2200 and the 2600 so I could figure out how many pi over threes I have. But I got this, and I can divide that by three. And if you're curious as to how I know I can divide that by three, it has to do with our division rules. And if all of these digits add up to a number that is divisible by three, then this number is divisible by three. And five plus three is eight, nine, 10. That gives me 15. And I know 15 is divisible by three, so I knew that this number was divisible by three. So all I get is this guy times the pi, because I already got rid of the denominator three. And that is what we got in our first response over here, okay? The second part is gonna be a little bit harder to take that derivative. So bear with me as I work on um, that second part. It's a little bit more confusing. <laughs> 